Welcome to the Finding Stable Ground Using Science and Partnerships to Manage Landslide Hazards. My name is Peter Little, and for the past decade I have managed the USGS Landslide Hazards Program. Thank you for taking the time to attend this briefing with us uh, and learn about landslide hazards across the United States. Landslides are a national issue that tend to be mitigated, or not as the case may be, at the state, county, and even local level. Through the Disaster Relief Act of 1974, the Stafford Act, the director of the USGS has been delegated the responsibility to issue disaster warnings for earthquakes, volcanoes, and landslides. Landslides occur in every state in the nation and can be triggered by major earthquakes, or more commonly by major rainstorms. They cost the nation billions of dollars every year, and tragically, as we have seen in the past 10 months, they have also killed close to 50 people this year. In that same time period, they have killed thousands around the globe. Landslide come in many types, including slow-moving ones that can cause major infrastructure damage but rarely cause death, and fast-moving ones that commonly kill. However, there are many aspects of landslides that we still don't know a lot about. Basically, hill slope hydrology is a complicated thing and can be influenced by many factors, including the underlying geology. At the request of Congress in 2000, the USGS wrote a national landslide hazards mitigation strategy, a framework for loss reduction. This document envisioned a strategy that developed stronger partnerships between the USGS and other federal agencies, as well as creating a landslide hazard program significantly larger than the one we have now. And even more importantly, it recognized the need for stronger partnerships among governments at all levels in expanding landslide research, mapping, assessment, real-time monitoring, forecasting, mitigation tools, and emergency preparedness and response. This strategy was vetted by the National Academy of Sciences, and their study endorsed this approach. All of these goals in the strategy are still important, and the amount we spend as a nation is still inadequate to, to accomplish many of these, but there have been some excellent advancements. USGS, working closely with the National Weather Service, has developed a post-wildfire debris flow warning system that provides important and timely information to emergency managers in the weeks after the fire has been put out, but before storms could cause major landsliding. And the USGS and some of our state geological survey partners have begun landslide inventories in a few places, landslide hazard mapping in a few places, and have worked with the American Planning Association to provide tools for local managers to mitigate landslide hazards. Well, good morning. I'm Dave Norman. I'm the Washington State Geologist. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, SR530 or OSO landslide and a little bit about the need for a cooperative uh, national landslide partnership program. So I'm just going to walk you through uh, the, the OSO landslide a little bit and some of the, the information on it. Uh, this event occurred March 22nd, 2014 at 10.37 a.m. We know that because of the seismic record. Uh, is a very precise measurement here. Uh, it's estimated to have a speed at about 60 miles an hour. It took less than one minute to cross the valley, uh, which is a, uh, almost a mile across this valley. It moved 10 million cubic yards of material. Uh, that would include the debris, the debris field and the body, the main body of the landslide itself. There were 42 people killed, and one person is still missing uh, that was not recovered. The landslide area is uh, 286 acres, and so that's about 0.45 square miles. And the but the recovery of the bodies or the human remains was uh, largely in about a 100 acre area that was what would be the distal end of the uh, debris field. And the flooded area uh, was about 0.6 square miles, so that's a one square mile uh, impacted area. There at at one time, there was more than 1,100 personnel working at this site in the, in the response and recovery of it. And there were more than 28 geologists, county, state, and federal, that were part of the response. And that response was largely to first to determine the stability and the safety of the landslide, and then for the, that really was looking at how to support the response and recovery uh, activities. 
the response was for over 70 days, and uh, it was for a long period of time. So far, the cost is greater than $120 million. That does not include the costs for uh, the DOT to put SR530 back in or uh, the Emergency Management uh, Division. Uh, they have not finalized their numbers. And to date, there have been 38 lawsuits filed against the state and the county. So uh, just an overview here of what we were doing the first uh, uh, I was one of the first geologists on the scene, and so our concerns as we flew in to look at this uh, landslide was what is, at, at any point, the geologists that first arrive are determining what the stability of the landslide is and what the safety of it is for the first responders. And then in this case, because the landslide dammed the river, what was the stability of the, of the impoundment or the landslide dam? And because this valley has so many other landslides in it, what, what, other, what is going on with those other landslides as, it, as uh, lateral stability was affected with other landslides. So uh, just, uh, I'm gonna just walk through a few photos here for you. So this one up is the, uh, up in the uh, northwest uh, section of this. It's the first view, as you can see, uh, there were emergency vehicles lined up for uh, quite some distance down SR 530, waiting to be able to go in to uh, do what they needed to do. Uh, the one in the northeast quadrant is sort of my first view uh, out the side. You can see the, uh, the river is, is almost completely dry from the impoundment and I'm getting my first glimpses of this debris field. The, uh, the valley then was completely flooded uh, for quite some distance up the, up the valley and was c continuing to flood as the river had not uh, breached the, uh, the debris field yet. And this, the one in the uh, southeast corner, shows the uh, sort of the area where a lot of people were already working and looking, looking for people in that area. And you can see it looks like soup. It's very saturated and uh, tough going. So this is the up in the northwest uh, quad of this of this uh, four of these four photos. Then the. Uh, you can see the, the main head scarp of the landslide and uh, down in the, the body of this, you can just start to see the river. There's some water in that, in that view that's sort of about halfway across the, the image and that's the North Fork of the Stillaguamish River trying to find a path through. In the northeast uh, corner of that, you can see the, the water trying to work its way around the, the toe of the landslide or the distal end and sort of the, in the right-hand side of that photo, you can see water also impounding and, and sitting on top of that, that landslide. And each of these paths was a potential path for the North Fork of the Stillaguamish to either breach or to fail more catastrophically than it did. And that's where, at that point then, we flew out. Helicopter time is very much at a premium, and we had decided at that point that it was not going to fail catastrophically that it would breach across the north end. And that's what the southwest uh, photograph is the next day. It breached about three hours after we left. And so it finds its way, and then the water level starts to go down incrementally then as it starts to build a, um, a channel. The, uh, the geology of this is uh, glacial sediments. It's all unconsolidated uh, glacial sediments. You can see the head scarp is near vertical of this, and uh, at the top of this is recessional outwash, uh, and then glacial till, and then in the bottom section of this for several hundred feet are glacial lacustrine sediments, which would be clays and silts. This is a fairly uh, modest slope. It's only 600 feet high off of the valley floor, and the, the mountains behind this are much more significant. They're up to 3,000 feet in, on average and 5,000 feet up to the top of the peak. Um, and then as the, uh, then as the days wore on, uh, the last photo is the uh, picture of the people doing recovery in the valley and uh, us just doing continued monitoring of the, of the landslide and the debris field. So the other part of this uh, talk is about trying to form a partnership and to where do we go from here. There have been significant uh, 
documents produced in the past uh, by USGS in 2003, National Research Council in 2004, and reviewing the need for a national cooperative partnership to be able to address landslides in this country. And to date, we have not got there. Uh, these strategies are uh, very well written and documented. I don't think we need to recreate anything here. It's just we need to take a look at this and, and understand it a little bit better and to look, work towards implementation. Um, the state geological surveys are in a key role here to be able to do the landslide inventories, the uh, susceptibility maps, and, and, and the data management of this and work with, with local government and for technical uh, outreach. The other critical thing that's needed is LIDAR, and I'll go into that a little bit about what that is and why we need it. A high resolution LIDAR is critical as one of the tools for, for not just this, but for many other things for the country. So LIDAR is uh, light detection and ranging. Uh, it's an aircraft that is uh, it used for uh, deploying this. You fly over at a certain level. You are then, you have to know a couple of things. You have to know your location. That's done by global positioning system. You have to know where, what the orientation of the aircraft is. And so you use the uh, inertial measurement unit for, for it. And you have to then uh, scan the ground with a light, with a, uh, with a laser. And there are so many pulses per square meter for high resolution. Uh, that's needed and it, it's the same technology really that's used by uh, policemen for giving you speeding tickets and then lastly it, it has to have a, quite a bit of processing because there's such a, 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 a lot of data here to be able to look at what the first returns are and what the last returns are to the aircraft so just a couple of examples beyond uh, landslides uh, there is a um, the top photo is just an air photo uh, of, the, of the, each of these images is the same area. So the top photo is an, an air photo. The second one, and you can see a uh, box down in the, in the lower corner, shows a uh, active fault or a fault trace that goes across the area. And then the third image is a uh, more um, zoomed in area. So these are crossing glacial flutes or glacial striations across the landscape of Washington. So these are kind of going diagonally across the screen and the fault is going uh, sort of horizontal across these uh, glacial flutes. Uh, LIDAR also is used uh, very effectively for looking at floodplains uh, because it gives you very accurate elevation models. Uh, you can uh, determine more accurately what the floodplain is. Not having accurate elevation information can either result in overestimating or underestimating what the floodplain is. So in this example, you can see uh, on the left, uh, that is a 10 meter DEM uh, derived from aerial photography. And so the contour interval is about you know, seven feet. Uh, the LIDAR on the right is a DEM or digital elevation model that is less, plus or minus one foot. And you can see that the, the, on the left, that there's a much greater area that is uh, estimated to be uh, flooded than it is on the right. So this is a, um, uh, an, the image of the uh, SR530 landslide or the, or the valley off. Each of these is the same area uh, for this. And the upper left hand corner, that's a digital elevation model, 30 foot digital. Uh, you can see there, it's, you can kind of get a feel for the, yeah, there's lots of, uh, of topography in this valley and escarpments. The right hand, the air photo area, same thing, you can kind of see, well, if you're an experienced eye and looking at air photos, you can get a lot of information out of this. Topographic map that on the left is a USGS 1 to, 1 to 24,000 scale uh, topographic map. Again, you can probably get an idea maybe. And then the geologic map on the right is something that was done in 2003, mapped the SR530 landslide, but doesn't pick up several of the other landslides in the valley. It was done without LIDAR. And so, uh, this is a very experienced geologist. He, he was able to measure or map some of the landslides in the valley and also the active fault that runs up the valley, but not necessarily get every landslide. So 
the 2014 LIDAR that was flown uh, just a few days after the event, you can see that all of the purple areas are landslides. Now they're accurately mapped. They're very clearly uh, shown here, and you can see the uh, SR-530 outlined in orange. You can see the debris field. You can see the one just to the west of it, the landslide there, uh, was not picked, while that landslide was mapped, it certainly did not pick up the debris field ac across the valley as much. And uh, you can see the, the less accurate delineation of these. So what are the gaps? Uh, currently, there's no national uh, coordination or standards on landslide hazard mapping amongst the private uh, sector, federal, state, or local government. There's no cooperative landslide program between the USGS or other federal agencies. And, and there are other federal agencies affected by this as well, DOT, FEMA, to name a few. Uh, then the state geological surveys, uh, as recommended in the 2004 National Research Council report. And much of the country remains insufficiently mapped. And the high resolution LIDAR that I spoke about is absent in many key areas of the country. And LIDAR is a fundamental tool for accurate landslide hazard mapping. And then there is no uh, method that's right now that's fully implemented for critical information to, regarding landslides to be communicated to local government and the public and to be part of a comprehensive solution. Our next speaker is Jennifer Bauer. Thanks, Peter and Dave. And I am from Asheville, North Carolina. I own a private consulting firm, geology consulting firm, and I used to work for the state, so I can give a private and a state point of view. <laughs> In September of 2004, Hurricane Ivan was crossing the mountains of Western North Carolina just two weeks after Hurricane Francis came across, dumping inches of rain in this area. The soil at the top of Fishhawk Mountain, which is the mountain shown here, could no longer hold all of that water, and it let loose in what we call a debris flow, traveling up to 30 miles an hour as it picked up more soil and boulders and trees flowing down the valley. It went two and a quarter miles down to the bottom where the Peaks Creek community was. This community didn't know what hit it. This debris flow killed four people, including a pregnant woman, and destroyed 15 homes and other structures in this area. This landslide, along with the hundreds of others that were caused during these hurricanes, caught the attention of the North Carolina General Assembly and FEMA. In 2005, the General Assembly authorized the Hurricane Recovery Act which started the North Carolina Geological Survey's Landslide Hazard Mapping Program. And the purpose of these mapping programs is to provide information so that people can make informed decisions, so that planners and emergency managers can know how to be prepared for these types of disasters. Now, I was one of the seven-member team of that Landslide Hazard Mapping Team. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about how hazard maps are created, some of the changes or glitches that happen during our program, and then some of the things that I feel could be done a little bit better as we go forward. During the course of our mapping program, as Dave mentioned, we used an iterative process where we started in the office using GIS tools, and then we'd go out in the field and verify what we saw. One of the tools that we would use were aerial photos, and they were from several different vintages, some taken by federal resources, the NRCS, some taken by state. This one is a 1940 aerial photo, and if you look, you can see all of the white stripes going down through there. Those are all paths of debris flows that happened in 1940. This is in a county in Western North Carolina. So we would look at the photos, identify areas that we needed to go check when we were in the field, and then go out and do that and come back to the office and compare. Another tool that we used were the geologic maps produced by the USGS state map and EDMAP programs. Having the geology as a base informed the models that we were using and the database that we were using or creating. And Dave just spoke a lot about LIDAR. LIDAR was one of the most critical pieces of 
these landslide hazard maps. We used it, the topography that the digital elevation model showed to map some of these large scale landslide features, the slow moving ones, as well as some of the ancient landslide deposits that you can kind of see they're outlined here in orange. Those are the ones that have happened over thousands of years, but we don't know where they started. We just know this is where they ended up. And that can sometimes inform where things might happen again in the future. We also use the LIDAR as a base for the hazard map models that we were producing in GIS. That data, the elevation data, was something that we could, was, was the base of the models. Over the course of this mapping program, and including what we've done as a private firm, this is the inventory that we have collected on landslides in North Carolina. There are over 3,500 landslides since 1916. We know the locations of. And over 3,300 of these ancient landslide deposits we know of because of these mapping pro programs. We also gathered information on how landslides affected people. Because that's really what this comes down to, right? We learned that since 1916, 48 people have been killed from landslides, including one that happened last year. Over 85 homes and other structures have been damaged or destroyed from landslides. These are things that we are trying to prevent with this mapping. The products of the, the landslide hazard mapping program at the Geological Survey were GIS-based products, so they could be used at various scales. And we had three different maps. The first one showed where we had mapped landslides and that were happening or have happened in the past. The second one at the top right was one of the GIS-based models showing where natural landslides might start given five inches of rain in 24 hours. Then the third map was also a GIS-based model based on the LIDAR that showed where natural landslides might travel down the slope during those same heavy rain events so that people who are living in those valley bottoms could be aware of the hazards that might be up above them. The mapping program at the state lasted from 2005 to 2011. And we were able to map four counties, Macon, Buncombe, Henderson, and Watauga counties. The use of these maps in these counties varies from county to county. For instance, in Buncombe County, they used the maps that we produced as one of the triggers to say when a property needs to have a site-specific evaluation done by a geotechnical engineer. In Macon County, the planners and the erosion control folks use the maps, but they don't have them published on any public website. In Henderson County, the planners don't even use and in Watauga, the planners don't, but the consultants do. So it varies from county to county. And I feel like this variability has a lot to do with the fact that the stakeholders, the people who were going to be using this map, these maps, weren't involved from the start. The way the program worked, we were given a mandate that said, make these maps. We did. We handed them to the county, and we said, here you go. There wasn't a lot of give and take or learning what they needed and how we could produce what they would actually use. Now, as a private firm, we are continuing to do these landslide hazard maps, but at a smaller scale. This small watershed in Haywood County is one that we recently completed the hazard maps for. In this process, we are communicating more with those stakeholders. We are getting them involved early the state hazard mapping program lost its funding due to some misconceptions about what the maps would produce. There were some that thought that they would be used for regulations or to control how people's properties were used. Now, as a private firm, we can work with these stakeholders and let them know this is just information for them to make smart decisions based on. We're using a very similar process as we go through this. We are using aerial photos from state and federal resources. 
we are using the geologic maps from the USGS state map and EDMAP programs. And the LIDAR is absolutely critical to the mapping that we're doing as well as the models that we are producing. This is a map of the inventory that we just completed for the small watersheds. And this was done from grant funding. Nonprofit approached us and said, we still want you to do these maps for us because they're worried about water quality. That's how we got funding to do this smaller watershed. So these maps are things that people want on these different various scales that Peter mentioned. As a consultant, I've seen through outreach that we've done, these maps starting to get used a little bit more. Now real estate agents are using them or pointing their clients to them. Consulting firms, engineering consulting firms are using them when they're talking to developers or working with the landowners. We as a consulting firm also work with the, the landowners and use these maps. In this example, we were working for a utility whose transmission line was being affected by the area outlined in green, an active landslide. We zoomed out and took a look at the LIDAR elevation model and saw that this entire area outlined in the dashed orange looks like it could have been an area that has moved in the past. And now per perhaps this green area is just a reactivated area. So these maps are being used, but it, it is incremental and just where they're available. The use of the landslide maps is becoming even more important with the observed change in the amounts of rain that we are getting. This is a figure put together by the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which recently published a 2014 National Climate Assessment. And this map shows the change in amounts of precipitation in the heaviest rainstorms from 1958 to 2012. So for example, in the southeast, Rainstorms now have 27% more rain in them on the heaviest events than in 1958. In the Northeast, there's 71% more rain falling. We know that there's a connection between the amounts of rain that are falling and the occurrence of landslides. So if, as we see more rain falling and these heavy extreme rain events happening more frequently, we're going to start seeing more landslides. It's important that we know where they might happen. Going forward, I feel like it's important that we continue this communication, this collaboration, and take it all the way down to the personal level. Because it's that landowner that it's going to affect the most. It's saving their lives or their property, their investment. By having these maps, not just here and there, but all over the state, all over all of the states that have landslide hazards, can provide this information to everyone who has this potential to be affected. And I feel like it's really important that we engage all of the stakeholders in the beginning of the program to head off any misconceptions or misunderstandings about how the maps would be used. This continued communication, I feel, needs to happen from the federal level at the USGS, the state geological surveys, academia, the industry, where we bring in the consulting firms, the real estate agents, the banking industry, and connect that with what's going on at the local government and the, the local people. Those are the ones, those are the people who we really want to reach. By having these landslide maps available, all of these people can help inform, making informed decisions, protecting people's investments, and hopefully avoiding or preventing disasters like the Peaks Creek or the Oso landslide from happening at all. Thanks. Okay, and our final speaker is Mike Chard from Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can read that or not, but it's a quote from uh, my deputy director, Sergeant Dan Barber, and it followed the September 11th, which is a very important national day, but also in my county now it has a, it's a date of significance in, in our county and state. Because on that day, till September 14th, we experienced uh, unprecedented flooding uh, related to a storm that came up from some tropical moisture, got stuck on a low pressure system, went up against the Rocky Mountains, and put 17 to 18 inches of rainfall on my county. Boulder was the bullseye of that particular storm, infected 17 counties in Colorado, created over $2 billion worth of damage. 
uh, killed 10 uh, people during that flood. And during that event, we saw unprecedented flooding, rainfall, and also landslide activity, which also was a big contributor in causing devastating damage to the county. Lost every road in my county for up to three days. It was the largest airlift since Katrina in, uh, in the U.S. history. Uh, we moved over 1,800 people from a stranded to 8,000 residents up in the mountains, had to move them into uh, shelters and, and render them care. So not only is it about what you see with the deep cut landslides that wipe out communities, there are also contributing factors in flooding events. And I'm going to show you a little bit about that. And USGS plays a critical role and, and how we approach at a local level, starting to mitigate these issues, how we respond to them, and also more importantly, how we plan strategically in the future. So you can see, Sergeant Barber, we were turning to the USGS, we have them on speed dial right now, so we were calling them all the time trying to get relevant data. We were really kind of nervous, what are, what are our next steps? So I'm gonna show you what those are. This, this is a fire though, I've had the luxury of being an emergency manager for not only that disaster, but another disaster, which was on September 6th of 2010, on Labor Day. And this was a fire that consumed 6,100 acres, 169 homes. It's the largest fire in Colorado history until Waldo and also High Park fires hit shortly thereafter, two years later. Uh, this is where it begins in the West. It's not like the East with uh, hurricanes coming in three days' notice. We get wildfires, rapidly developing thunderstorms, which dump six to eight inches of rainfall, and then, of course, saturating monsoonal flows is the reasons why we have landslides. Fires like this burn off six inches of duff, which is organic material, acts like a sponge that absorbs moisture and water. Uh, it also burns off all the canopy that's over the forest, so you get buckets of water falling out of the sky now as opposed to trickling it down through the forest canopy. And then, of course, it causes hydrophobic uh, soils, which are waxy, and basically turns it into a slip and slide and increases runoff, which also then increases the scouring effect. The USGS gets called in right away. The big, biggest and brightest minds come in and help us locals out. They start doing assessments in a lot of ways. You'll see in the lower right-hand corner there, it's a map that starts showing us high uh, debris flow areas and drainages within the canyon areas that are post-fire event. And we use that data to start warning residents because at the bottom of all our canyons, and a lot of the, a lot of the West people like to build next to babbling brooks and have a very scenic outdoor experience. <laughs> they like trees built up next to their house and creeks next to their deck. And they don't realize that when, when Mother Nature unleashes these forces, uh, they're, they're catastrophic to loss of property, infrastructure, and more importantly, life. The USGS, though, does provide this assessment early on, and this can be used critically for us because it allows us to know where we need to go in and do some mitigation. We'll do aerial mulching, put wood chips and straw on these steep slopes so it can reduce the runoff effect, which will decrease the debris flow problems. We'll also use it to focus limited funds and where we do revegetation efforts to try to get ground cover and stabilize some of the hillsides. And then, of course, they'll provide infrastructure. That's hard to see there, but the slide on the left of the picture there, that's actually a USGS stream gauge that was put into a drainage, Four Mile Candy Creek drainage, which was evaluated by a flood paleontologist who says this hasn't flooded in 30,000 years. And that drainage has flooded twice now in three. So I feel pretty fortunate to be part of that statistical amount. Um, they've also not only put stream gauges in, they've also put some video stream cameras on, on creeks that are uh, upstream of some you know, high value assets and, and density uh, communities or uh, dense population communities to allow us to do real time monitoring of outflow from rainstorms but also visually confirm what we're seeing in our EOC related to the, to the data from the stream gauges. And lastly, that's from the uh, Waldo uh, fire down in Colorado Springs. USGS went ahead and did an assessment of the number of debris flows that were noticed after the fires. This is the cycle that we get in the West. You get a fire, you start, it unstabilizes the ground, you get rainfall on it, debris flows come out. And we've been experiencing in our area, the Four Mile Canyon fire, uh, that, that's been causing debris flow and land movement for since 2010 and has uh, caused some problems but we'll be able to stay ahead of it through, through some luck and also some preparation. Like I said, our risks in Colorado and like any place along the greater west, uh, you know, wildfire does set us up to have problems. Uh, we get these very intense thunderstorms that will uh, cause six to eight inches of rainfall somewhere. You know, you get this mixing line around the 40th parallel and up, you know, the, uh, the front range is cool and, you know, tropical air and moisture meets cold air and then that creates a pretty crazy weather patterns here. Uh, we just went through that phase in Colorado and, and uh, those storms will definitely create problems for us uh, with, you know, saturating the ground from an intensity event. The next piece we get is upslope type events or 
we get tropical storms. I watch hurricanes in Colorado all the time. My county is flooded three times from hurricanes that come up the Yucatan Peninsula, float in, grab a low pressure system, push it up against the Rockies, and then just sits there and dumps water continuously. And that saturates the ground. And we saw that on September 11th. We had three days of rain prior to the event. And then we saw four days of uh, even more flow, just nonstop. It rained literally for four days straight, never stopped. Never lifted, just was a mess. Uh, and that's kind of what happens. That's Jamestown up in the upper right hand corner. You can see a little bit of some uh, deep cut move on the right side, a smaller one. But one thing we noticed in this particular flood was that there was a tremendous amount of debris flow. That was the slurry that comes off the side of the mountain that moves fast. And uh, it did kill one of our residents in Jamestown. And you can see that in the upper right hand corner. Joey uh, was a longtime resident, uh, mayor. You can see that's the front side of his house and that's the back side of his house. This came off of about oh, a mile away. There was a fire that occurred 10 years ago, the Overland fire, which I actually was on as a firefighter. And that debris flow came down and crushed him in his sleep. He never had a chance. Uh, you can see La Plata County in the upper left. This is also from uh, down in the you know, southern part of the state. This, this was a massive flood and debris flow that wiped out a lot of roads, put you know, nine, inch or nine feet of debris over a road base, uh, impacted a lot of homes. The Waldo Canyon fire, you can see lower left with the BMW sitting there. This is down in Manitou Springs. Uh, this debris flow came through, wiped out 25 homes, uh, destroyed a bunch of businesses and infrastructure. And of course, most, the Mesa County one just recently occurred in Colorado. And that one is four miles wide um, or long, two miles wide and 250 deep in places and it killed three Coloradans during that. So, you know, this is what happens. These, the two faces we have is we eat debris flows, which is that slurry mix of rock and organic material and anything else that it collects in its pathway, comes shooting down through steep slopes, doesn't slow down really till it hits a flattened out spot. And uh, at the bottom of canyons and drainages, this is where these, uh, these threats occur. And then, of course, then you get the uh, sort of debris dams from deep cut type landslides, which we saw during the, uh, the flood of 2013 on September 11th. And we didn't see the, the intensities of rain we were getting didn't match the amount of flows we were seeing in output. And the reason for that was these canyons would literally have a debris dam form. It would build up this tremendous hydraulic mass of force and build it behind it would blow it out. And then these walls of water would come shooting down through the canyons. And when they did hit, it increased the dramatic devastation that they would cause. It would increase the, the life safety risk because there would be no intensity that would cause us to think we needed to warn on that. And then people would just all of a sudden find that they were in these uh, traumatically dangerous situations without a lot of warning. So the reaction time is very small. The current practice is the local level that uh, we've implemented, and I'm sure other communities have too, to try to deal with this issue, with this issue are related right around public education. And uh, we looked to the USGS to give us best practices on information that we could tell the community. We held over 50 community meetings since this flood, and not just talking about stream restoration, but also here's the threats, and one of the threats is landslides and debris flows, which has been dramatically increased since this flood. Uh, after a big rain event like this, and you gotta understand in Colorado, our annual rainfall was 14 inches. And we took 17 inches over these three days. So our water table has been elevated in, in our state, which increases the risk factor for landslides. So we've got mine shafts at 8,000 feet that no, normally you could kick a rock in and hear it ping pong all the way down, and now it goes ping pong, boom, into the water. We've got three million extra gallons of water in the sewer system uh, in, uh, in the city of Boulder. People's sump pumps are nonstop running. So. The water table's up. Springs are activated all over the hillsides and the mountains, which are indicating that we have a problem. Uh, so we want to notify the community what to look for. Part of that, though, is that when you inform the community and they become savvy about the risks, then guess what happens to their expectations? They elevate what are you doing, and that's where some of our gaps are formed. Uh, so we did the public information. We uh, provided that information on what to look for for signs. Uh, you know, leaning trees, more rock forward than usual, scarps that may or cuts in the landscape, you know, up upheaval of roads. We also evaluated our public warning system. We created special polygons for geometric shapes that allow us to target and focus our messaging because we wouldn't have the time we normally would have. A lot of times you draw a big circle and you kind of just send the message out and that will spool up with our emergency telephone warning system. Any, any telephone warning system in any community only has about a 20-25% capacity of the overall users, so it spools and will delay warnings out, but if you can create specific zones, it will definitely increase the, the time it takes to notify. 
So we create polygons for every drainage in our county. We put special messaging on it because people need to know because if it's a flood, you want to climb to safety. If it's a landslide, you want to evacuate out of the area. It's important to get direct messaging and be able to do that quickly. Uh, our fire chiefs were all brought up to speed on this and law enforcement so they could say you polygon 17 with message two, they launch it. Uh, it also brought into effect that we created special messaging for people with access uh, needs that they could go and drive out maybe a couple hours earlier so we worked to try to deal with our vulnerable populations in these areas. And then we developed plans. You know, the hazard mitigation plan, we have one of those in the county. It's important to have that because it gives you a strategic way to look at not only how you maybe approach this problem prior to the event, but also post-disaster to make sure that your post-disaster mitigation efforts are going to, to fit into a more strategic overview to try to limit or, or prevent the risk from happening again. And then, of course, we did a Thyra, which is a threat hazard identification risk assessment, and this helped us not only identify you know, what flood hazards we have, but also landslides are part of this. And this is used to help you proceed forward with operational response and also help FEMA in, in modifying some federal guidance and responding to the disaster that we currently have. This is the outcome when mitigation fails. And uh, I throw the maps in there because those, those are USGS maps that happen after the event. You look at them, the dots or the green dots indicate where landslides or debris flows occurred within our county. All those rescue operations you're seeing there by picture are in those identical areas. So what it shows is that there is some strong validation in the assessments done by USGS to look at that and be able to figure out, okay, what's the response need going to be, but more importantly, what's the messaging expectations and how do we get people to safety and notify them early. And this, of course, was you're going to lose infrastructure. Like I said, we lost roads. We couldn't get in there. We had to use the Army and National Guard to airlift people out. Rescue teams had to wade through water and muck to get people that were stranded in homes. We literally had homes that survived the flood and their house was sliding off the side. One of the most harrowing calls we had was a elderly woman whose husband was in the bottom floor, she's in the top floor, they're 800 feet above it, and their house was sliding off the side of the canyon mountain. She's calling in and she's screaming, my husband's below, I can't get out. Another story we had was an old mine shaft that blew out. People all the way to the secondary home above it, and this was in Salina, which is in Four Mile Canyon. Side mine shaft blew out. Uh, they were sleeping in their bed, they came through the house, they were filling with water, he was drowning, his wife was able to escape, she, he was trapped in about three feet of mud, and then just as he had his last breath, the back side of the building blows out, the water escapes, but now mud is filing in, and, and she and a neighbor um, spent three hours clawing to keep the mud off of her husband's face and chest so he could breathe. When I went to see her, about five days later after this, she was walking around with fingers all bandaged up because all her fingernails were gone from clawing at the, at the mud to keep her husband alive. It's just these incredible stories from these, these landslide and flood events. So here's where we begin. From a local perspective, right off the bat, is we need to know where the high risk areas are. The USGS does a fantastic job of providing us information. That map in the upper right hand corner is Boulder County. This was provided post flood. We had one the last time it was done, it was in 1976, I believe. The USGS came out and did a fantastic job kind of showing what the risks were going to be. We held a community meeting, this was back in March. And then we received that map. And uh, we're using that right now currently for our planning. Uh, we're also trying to look at some potential infrastructure development there, hopefully longer term, that will uh, provide a better level of public safety uh, moving forward. But the signs are out there. We know what to tell people to look for. Uh, the cuts in the ground, the unleveling. This is all new stuff, by the way, uh, in our county. Uh, this is a trail up there with the heavy rocks coming down. It gives you an idea of the sort of experience that we, we had during this flood. It's not just about flooding when this happens. It's a lot about landslides. And of course, you need to have the relationship, who to call. We've got strong relationships with NRCS, and we also have the USGS. Um, and there's a, and also BLM gets into this equation sometimes. There's a lot of other federal agencies that, uh, as a local perspective, but my job as emergency manager is to get those relationships, make sure they're tied together well, and if they're not, make them. And that's what I, uh, I do. And then what we do uh, not have, though, is an early warning system. So everything's based. We've got a well-trained community. They all know what to look for. Uh, they're out scouring the lands. You know, we've worked with the rock climbing communities to see if they notice things. Anyone that's out in, in these areas we want to report, we've got, created an SOP, a standard operating procedure, that if the community reports it to our 911 centers, they know how to dis get, get a deputy to go out, check it, put that into county engineering, and then start ramping this up. So we have a good way of detecting when the signs are there. But what I don't have is, the conditions around by which this is forming, and it all begins with soil saturation. 
We don't have sensors. I've got rain gauges, I've got stream gauges all over my county to let me evaluate what the hydrological impacts are due to thunderstorms or monsoonal flows. What I don't have, though, is when is the soil too saturated? How does the, slope, the degree of slope, soil composition, and soil saturation all equate to a risk? Because if that can all be put into a trigger point, that gives me an effective tool, allows me to warn residents. It gives them a choice to leave their, to leave their home or their business. It also puts maybe a higher degree of awareness into looking for signs that there are problems forming around them. This is a map of all the uh, debris flows that occurred in our county uh, during the flood. There's 750 plus up there. And uh, they pretty much correlate back to that earlier one you saw with the brown shadow in the high risk areas of our county. So it just demonstrates that the, the preemptive or pre-event assessments do actually match up with post-event experience. So it is, a, it is a, a, a useful tool to use USGS forecasting information for emergency planning. This is actually uh, in our area right now, if I'm Linden Drive, it's a scarp you can see up there, or a real fancy term for a cut in the side of the hill. And uh, our only method of tracking this right now is we got it staked. So the local fire department is going up and measuring it all the time, but it doesn't take into account what instability we have or the subtle things that really you're only going to see if you'd use a, a much more detailed approach to assessing it. LIDAR is critical here. We had LIDAR, pre-LIDAR data because our involvement with floodplain management in our county, we used that tremendously post-event because it did give us the elevation differences and looking at where the creeks had deposition of sediment due to the landslide movement, put a lot of earth in the creeks. That would be invaluable to have to see that we had a scarp open up someplace and you could do another flyover, get more LIDAR data and do a, a pre and post comparison to be able to monitor that, put some sensors on that and be able to warn folks. So this is you know, sort of that piece of what's the preemptive side, soil saturation, post side is when you actually see signs or symptoms of a problem, how do you get things on it to actually monitor and increase public warning and safety. This is a conversation I had with one of our residents. As you can see, uh, he's a very uh, forceful individual, Earl Perry, great guy, uh, holds me accountable for a lot of things. And uh, as his awareness came up, so did his expectations. And so that's part of this, you know, we talk about collaboration and cooperation. Be sure that if you're going to step into that floor wave, you're also committed to do something with it. Because if you don't, you'll lose your public trust pretty quickly. It's great you know about it, but you do nothing about it. Uh, that's the stuff that will make people extremely angry and betrayal becomes a pretty powerful emotion after an event happens and people lose homes and lives. What will make a difference moving forward? You know, planning and zoning are great from a strategic standpoint, which is don't put people around a hazard. I don't know how we do that in our nation. That means D.C. and every other place needs to move inland. You know, how many miles and we'll get people out of the canyons once all that occurs. We like to build around hazards. So, but there are things we can do with mitigation and hardening and armoring up our communities with a mitigation plan, with good planning and, and you know, implementing some projects to, to do that. Monitoring systems are important. We've already talked about that. It's really critical that we are able to monitor soil saturation. The capability is there. We just don't have the program to do it yet, or nor the, nor the focus strategy right now. And I hope that can change. The ground movement, like I said, the LIDAR uh, will be, I can't stress how important it is to be able to be, do real-time monitoring of that. Multiple public warning methods. And every community at the local level, you know, there's emergency telephone warning systems. There's uh, civilian protocol within the National Weather Service, a lot of emergency managers don't know how to execute quick completely, which is to use that system beyond just, uh, you know, a weather event. You can use it for really any event. Uh, wireless emergency alerts on your, on your phone, public uh, warnings, outdoor warning systems with sirens. You know, there's you, making sure that everyone knows what they have, making sure that it's calibrated and that they can execute the use of those systems quickly and efficiently. And then, of course, that strong community engagement and partnering. You definitely need to, to engage your community, not just after the event, but prior. We've had the luxury of having seems like a disaster almost every couple of years, uh, either a state or federal, and it keeps people's awareness up and interested. We were just talking about this before the event. People don't want to wake up every day and go, what's going to kill me today? So your window of opportunity to have a strong amount of influence and create motivation with your community is dependent a lot of times these events that occur how prepared are you to be able to go in and then really grab hold and try to start to change some behavior and increase some awareness in different direction you can use really tied to some of these events. Uh, and lastly, the correct action that people need to know is not just around getting involved, but also knowing you know, how to receive information, know how to take correct action so that when they do get a warning, they, they can uh, try to save their lives. 
And on that note, the, in closing, it's just uh, at, at a local level, it's a very complex problem. There needs to be, I think, a, 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 like I agree, a, a tighter federal guidance and, and cooperation to help implement some of these needs at a local level, which have also state and federal impacts. And I think uh, to, to kind of end on a quote, as I like to do, uh, you know, Charles Darwin, it's not always the strongest nor the smartest that will survive, but the most adaptive that will. And that's, I think, the key here is as things are changing around us, we have to be more adaptive. It's not a question of should we, it's a question of we must. So on that note, thank, thank you, you for Mike. your time today.